On February 24th, 2022, Russian troops invaded Ukraine, embarking on an unprovoked military aggression against an independent European country, sparking an international outcry with countries rallying to defend Ukraine in what many described as the biggest threat to peace and security in Europe since the end of the Cold War. The human and financial costs have been steep, with tens of thousands of innocent civilians in Ukraine dead and injured, and millions more displaced and now living as refugees. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of soldiers have died on both sides. One year on, Ukraine has suffered unimaginable losses, its buildings, roads, and infrastructure destroyed, and the cost of the war escalating. Here, Alan Weiner, Stanford Law School lecturer in law and an international legal scholar with expertise in international conflict resolution and international criminal law, discusses the law of war, the limitations of the UN to rein in member nations, NATO support for Ukraine, how this historic conflict might end, and more. I'm going to start with just uh, later this month, I think on February 24th, will mark the anniversary of Russia's uh, in, in invasion of Ukraine, um, which I think began with a an attempt to quickly seize the capital, Kiev. And of course, that didn't happen, thank goodness. Can you just talk about international law and what international law says about that? Was it a violation of international, of, of the UN Charter um, for, you, for Russia to invade Ukraine? Okay. Um, I mean, it's a great question. You know, uh, it's always interesting um, to teach um, you know, complex, difficult, uh, real world questions. Um, you know, when I teach international law, I would say that Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you know, would not be a very challenging exam question for most of my students because it is a quite blatant uh, violation of Article Two, Paragraph Four of the UN Charter, which provides that states, you know, are not allowed to use force in their international relations. Uh, so again, there's a clear prohibition on the use of force in, uh, in uh, under the UN Charter in international law. Um, there are only two exceptions. One exception is self-defense, and the other exception is the use of force um, that is authorized uh, pursuant to the collective security powers of the Security Council acting under Chapter 7. Um, neither of those is present here. There are some other um, sort of more contentious or more ambiguous uh, disputed theories under which states can use force under international law. Uh, but again, I think neither of those would apply here either. The Russians have said um, they've offered two justifications for the use of force, really. W one is that um, they somehow perceive that they're threatened by Ukraine because Ukraine uh, might be joining NATO and could conceivably have nuclear weapons stationed on its territory. But again, the right of self-defense is available when you sustained an armed attack, or if there is a right of anticipatory self-defense, which is debated, but even if there is a right of anticipatory self-defense, it's only to ward off an imminent attack. Not that Ukraine some years down the road might join NATO. That's clearly not what the right of anticipatory self-defense contemplates. The other um, defense or justification the Russians have somehow offered is that, well, they were protecting co-ethnics, Russian ethnics, um, eth uh, ethnic Russians in Ukraine from genocide. Hmm. Now, there's a big debate about whether states can use force to protect their nationals in a foreign country or can use force to halt humanitarian abuses that are taking place in another country, but we don't really have to dig too deeply into the legal justifications because there seems to simply be no factual support for the claims that ethnic Russians were being subjected to atrocities by the Ukrainian government. It simply isn't true. And so whether or not there would be a legal basis for it, if it were true, seems immaterial. Okay. And has the UN done enough to rebuke Russia? And well, the UN has done really all it can under okay. these circumstances. Um, so when, after the uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine, the matter was immediately brought to, um, you know, to the Security Council and 
there was a debate in the Security Council. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, but the way that the Security Council is designed, the five permanent members of the Security Council, the United States, uh, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom, have the ability to block um, uh, the Security Council from taking um, action. And the Russians, you know, maybe not uh, surprisingly, um, blocked uh, the Security Council from acting. Um, in response to that, um, the case was referred to the General Assembly. Uh, the General Assembly uh, actually adopted a vote that deplored Russia's invasion of Ukraine and demanded that Russia cease its use of force against Ukraine by a, a quite substantial majority. The vote for that was, if I'm not mistaken, um, 143 in favor and five against. Now, there were 35 abstentions, uh, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but the point is, for these purposes, that the decisions of the General Assembly are essentially seen as recommendations. They have no legally binding force of the same kind that decisions of the Security Council uh, would have. We've seen other decisions. There has been a lawsuit brought um, in the International Court of Justice by Ukraine. Um, that has only been through its earliest stage, the, the so-called um, provisional measure stage, but the court um, adopted a quite uh, clear decision uh, demanding that Russia suspend its uh, military operations. Of course, Russia disregarded both the decision of the General Assembly and the order of the uh, International Court of Justice. Does this highlight the limitations of the UN? Um, you know, that, that a country can uh, violate the, the charter of the UN and still have such power is pretty incredible. It is pretty incredible. Look, um, you know, international law, unlike domestic legal systems, um, at least the way that I think of it, is really largely a consent-based system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's not a world government. There's not a world police force. Mm -hmm. um, it is a system of cooperative uh, exchanges of commitments. And, you know, when the um, main instrument for international security, uh, the UN Charter, was adopted, it was built with a particular power structure in mind. And essentially it was uh, built upon the assumption that the five states that had won World War II uh, had defeated uh, the Axis powers, Japan and Germany, that those five states would sort of remain aligned um, as forces to suppress aggression of the kind that Japan and Germany had perpetrated. And the UN Charter provides those five states with a guarantee that the international system won't be turned against them. Yeah. And that is essentially the veto, the so-called veto mechanism, which means that uh, binding resolutions of the Security Council require the, uh, require the concurring votes uh, of the permanent members. Now, this obviously means that um, actions by the powerful members or their close allies Right, are not going to be subjected to kind of the collective security mechanisms of the Security Council. Now, the United States, you know, um, was maybe not opposed to this kind of approach when, for instance, there was a resolution proposed that would have condemned the U.S. use of force against Kosovo in 1999, right? Mm -hmm. um, or um, sometimes the Security Council has sought to condemn American allies, uh, in particular Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and the United States has itself exercised the veto power. So it is a, uh, a system, the general, uh, the UN charter system is, a, is one that basically is limited when the core interests of the, of the great powers, or at least the powers that were the great powers in 1945, right. they're not necessarily today's great powers in all respects, mm -hmm. um, but when the powers, when the interests of the great powers or their close allies are implicated, we clearly see the limits of uh, how the United Nations can operate. Now, that is based on the system that we design. So yeah. we now live with the consequences. How do you think sanctions overall are working? Uh, sanctions of the West, Biden leading the charge in many of the EU nations. Uh, yeah, sanctions have been places. very extensive. Um, they, uh, there has been, uh, there has been very, at some point, somebody called me up right after the Russia sanctions were imposed and said, like, is, would you characterize this as the most 
extensive set of sanctions ever? And I said, well, no. Um, you know, you've forgotten the kinds of sanctions that were imposed on Iraq by the United Nations in 1990 after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. But nevertheless, because the sanctions in this case have not been imposed by the uh, United Nations Security Council for the very reasons that we've discussed. The council right. was not able to adopt a resolution, but we've seen nevertheless um, unilateral measures by states or groups of states like the European Union um, that have involved um, certainly what are very extensive sanctions against uh, Russia. Um, I think there's a debate among experts about what the effects of um, these sanctions have been. Um, you know, one of the real problems is that uh, the most severe sanctions or the most draconian sanctions, uh, which would be a complete ban on Russian energy exports, are not possible because of the dependence of Western Europe on Russian natural gas oil, but particularly natural gas exports. Mm -hmm. And so even during 20, the past year, Russia has continued um, to um, earn substantial foreign exchange through the export of energy, including um, in some cases to those countries that are most deeply opposed to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so there have been, uh, the, the sanctions have been extensive. I think that we believe that in the technology area in particular, that Russia is beginning to face real pressure with respect to its ability to get uh, um, uh, chips, in particular semiconductor chips, to allow it to rebuild and replicate some of its high technology areas. GDP has fallen, debt has increased, but it's a personalist country, a personalist dictatorship, um, where if there is any disaffection or uh, economic pressure that the population is suffering, I don't think this is enough to cause the government to change from its path in the short term. The effect of sanctions is is really going to be sustained over the longer term. Now, the death toll on both sides, the Ukrainian side and the Russian side, has been quite steep, but also a mass exodus from what we're reading of um, men in particular from Russia, avoiding the draft, um, and also just those who were posed. Um, I, I, I was reading that this could be a real realignment of the, the Russian culture almost uh, going forward. It's... I mean, I'm not a, an expert on domestic Russian yeah. politics. We certainly have seen in response to the latest mobilization, right? I mean, a couple of things have happened. Number one, Russia had to have a significant mobilization, um, which had not been expected because the so-called special military operation, which was expected to be a lightning swift operation, which would bring you know this government in uh, Kiev to its knees, right? Has turned into uh, a long, stalemated, bloody war. And so the first thing that happened was that Russia had to mobilize to conscript significant numbers of, um, of, of, of Russian men. Uh, as you say, uh, we saw substantial numbers of uh, Russians leave the country, going to Turkey, to some of the Central Asian republics. Um, um, and we've seen tremendous suffering. I mean, the Russian, those troops, we see read reports about those Russian conscripts being sent to the front lines, you know, without adequate training, they're being sent forward as kind of human waves uh, in some of these um, infantry battles. And it seems like it seems like uh, the human loss is really uh, terrible um, on, on, on both sides. Um, but the Russian troops, again, in particular, it seems to be a, a kind of a, a mass slaughter of, of Russian troops in the hopes of overwhelming uh, Ukrainian positions. Um, we nevertheless continue to see, to the extent that we can, um, quite um, significant levels of support for both President Putin and for the so-called special military operation in Russia. Uh, I think this reflects two things. Uh, number one, um, state media is uh, very, very um, heavily controlled uh, by the Russian government. Uh, a lot of uh, foreign sources of information, you know, Facebook has been banned, international social media uh, platforms have been turned off, only YouTube is still uh, left on, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is kind of, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the state media itself um, is pushing out a very, very consistent line. Um, and the second thing is it highlights there's a really significant generational divide, I think, that we're seeing in, in Russia. Younger people in Russia who have more access to alternative sources of media, who are able to learn more about what is going on, who are the ones who are susceptible to being uh, mobilized, as they say in Russia, and their families. 
I think are much less supportive. There's an older generation of Russians who get their information mainly from watching television, where mm -hmm. state media control is most intense, um, and who are very sympathetic or, or, or they resonate with some of the, the messages that President Putin tells about um, this struggle being kind of a, a continuation of the Great War, Russia's struggle against uh, Nazi Germany in World War II. And so we do see, a, a, I think, a very significant variation in the levels of support uh, among different uh, age groups in Russia. Do you, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here, but can you foresee criminal prosecution of Putin or any of his officials when this war ends? Um, I can certainly, so the situation, the, the, the criminal law situation is complicated. Um, the International Criminal Court um, actually does because of Ukrainian declarations. Ukraine made a couple of declarations consenting to the jurisdiction of the ICC. So the International Criminal Court does have jurisdiction over some crimes that have been committed on Ukrainian territory, mainly um, war crimes, maybe crimes against humanity, um, or acts of genocide, but because of the idiosyncratic structure of the Rome statute, the statute that gives the uh, that created the ICC, because Russia is not a party to the Rome statute, the court is not able to exercise jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Hmm. Uh, it has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, but in this case, it doesn't have the ability to assert that a crime with respect to Russian perpetrators. So the main crime that one would think that Putin could be charged with would be the crime of aggression. Um, and the court does not have jurisdiction over that. I can see um, Russian soldiers, Russian commanders being held responsible for war crimes. There's quite, are being charged with war crimes. There are quite extensive evidence of atrocities have been committed. Whether or not it would be possible to um, indict Putin um, would require questions of whether or not uh, there was evidence that he was in command and control and directed those specific operations. That's difficult to do as an evidentiary matter, right? You need to know not only that Putin was the commander in chief of the uh, Russian armed forces, but that he actually had sort of operational control or direction over specific operations. So uh, I, can ex I expect to see um, prosecutions or at least indictments against Russian officials, Russian soldiers, Russian military personnel, perhaps you know, going up to the uh, ministry of, Minister of Defense level. Whether or not the civilian leadership is also uh, charged with those crimes remains to be seen. So that's the International Criminal Court. There could also be prosecutions or at least indictments in domestic courts. Um, it turns out, you know, we've already seen Russians uh, tried and, in fact, convicted in Ukrainian courts, Russian soldiers who have been captured in, in Ukraine. Some of them have been put on trial or actually they've been guilty pleas. Um, and theoretically, we could actually see prosecutions under domestic Ukrainian law for the crime of aggression, because there is a crime of aggression under domestic Ukrainian law going back to uh, the post-World War II era, you know, Ukraine sustained aggression at the hands of the uh, Nazi German regime, and they enacted a law making aggression a crime under Ukrainian law. You could also see prosecutions for some number of war crimes in the domestic courts of, of other countries in Europe, for instance, that have universal jurisdiction. Germany, the Netherlands, and other, other number of other countries actually have war crime statutes that make it a crime uh, to uh, commit these offenses, whether or not the offense occurred on your territory. So there are a number of fora that potentially have jurisdiction, Ukrainian courts, European courts, and the International Criminal Court. Now, whether Putin actually ends up ever being tried or whether others end up being tried involves a separate issue of whether or not these courts would be able to gain custody uh, mm -hmm. over um, somebody like Putin. I, again, in the case of the Ukrainian nationals, I'm sorry, in the case of the Ukrainian prosecutions, the Russian soldiers who've been prosecuted were prisoners who were captured right, in the context of the ongoing fighting. Um, you know, I don't expect the Minister of Defense of Russia, um, or I don't expect, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin to be captured, you know, on the battlefield. Yeah. Um, and so if the ICC or a national court were to initiate a, uh, you know, an indictment against them, they would then have to request the surrender of those individuals. Well, while the current regime is in power in Russia, I don't expect that to happen. 
I just note, though, in passing, um, the things that we believe were never possible can sometimes become possible. You know, when I was in my, uh, when I was working in the U.S. State Department in the Legal Advisor's Office, in my last assignment there, I was working as the legal counselor at the U.S. Embassy in The Hague, and we were working very closely with the Yugoslavia War Crimes uh, Tribunal. And Slobodan Milosevic, the president of uh, Serbia, had been indicted for atrocities committed in both Kosovo and in Bosnia, but he was the president. He was the head of state. And the idea that like Milosevic would ever turn himself over to the ICTY was you know, fanciful. It was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But circumstances changed, and Milosevic fell from power. And I was still in my job in 2001 and was involved in helping to arrange the transfer of Slobodan Milosevic from Serbia to Bosnia to the Netherlands, wow. um, where he was brought into custody and was put on trial. Now, of course, he uh, he committed suicide before he was uh, before his trial finished. But the the point is that there is no statute of limitations on. Uh, these kinds of crimes. And so do I expect to see Vladimir Putin in the dock today? No. Tomorrow? No. In three years? No. At some point? Well, perhaps. That's very interesting. Um, so Ukraine really has been um, decimated, but the West support seems to be holding. Let's see what happens in another year. Can you foresee any rationale for NATO doing anything? Well, I don't think NATO, I think NATO has done a great deal in terms of providing financial assistance, uh, material assistance, training assistance. I mean, I think one of the things that's so interesting is that, you know, the United States and its NATO allies had for decades prepared for the possibility of a conventional invasion of Western Europe by the old Soviet Union. I mean, that's what NATO was created to do, was to guard against that. And the expectation always was that NATO forces would face a just dramatically superior conventional force in numerical numbers. Hmm. And so the training and the tactics that NATO states were developed during those years was to focus on the use of light mobile units, that could have uh, high mobility, tactical superiority as a way of trying to uh, uh, attack uh, these the superior kind of ground force uh, without engaging in a frontal assault. Mm. That's exactly what NATO trained Ukrainian troops to do in the run-up to this invasion, and it's exactly what they did to basically forestall uh, Russia's attempt to capture uh, the capital Kyiv. Right, so. NATO training, I think, has been essential um, for the success um, of Ukraine's defense, and its weapons have been essential for uh, uh, its defense. Now, does NATO actually want to um, engage in active armed conflict? Do they want to do what the United States and other countries did in, uh, in Kuwait in, in 1990 and actually go to war with the aggressor to expel Russia from Kuwait as we sought to ex uh, expel Russia from Ukraine as we sought to expel Iraq from Kuwait? No, I think the answer is quite clearly that NATO has no interest or no desire to do that simply because the risk of armed conflict with one of the two largest nuclear powers in the world um, creates unacceptable risks of escalation. Okay. So I think- They're doing all the they can. So they'll do all they can, but to stay on this side of the line of not becoming an actual party to the armed conflict, not becoming an actual belligerent. I will say, I have not one, but two students who are working on the question of at what point does support for Ukraine, at what point would the support by NATO states or the United States actually make the United States a belligerent such that mm -hmm. we would be in a state of armed conflict with Russia. There's some ambiguity about this among international law, international humanitarian law experts in the field. Um, but I know uh, that the State Department and the US government in general is determined to stay on this side of the line. We are not in a state of armed conflict with Russia because I think, uh, again, the, the, the notion of 
an exchange of fire between Russian forces and the risks um, that that could escalate into very, very dangerous um, areas very quickly is something that, um, that, that NATO states want to avoid. And frankly, that I think um, despite the rhetoric that the Russian military wants to avoid as well. We keep chipping away at that though, don't we? With each escalation of what we'll send and what we won't send, that debate, it, keep, it, it keeps shifting, but so far we've been okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the we first provided only defensive weapons, mm. then we provided offensive weapons, then we provided offensive weapons that actually, particularly with some of the artillery um, pieces that have the ability to array sufficiently long range that they could actually strike targets in Russia. And again, we you know wanted, but we've told the Ukrainians, as I understand it, that you can't use those weapons to hit targets in Russia. You can use them to hit Russian targets on Ukrainian territory. Now, again, that's according to the position, the views of the United States and Ukraine. Russia believes a lot of those shells are already landing on mm -hmm. Russian territory because they have annexed um, territories um, in the so-called Donbas, uh, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, and Luhansk. Uh, and so Russia actually considers some of the battlefield to be Russian territory. Hmm. So that creates real dangers, but, but uh, that is not a position that the US um, or Ukraine certainly have accepted. And in terms of limitations that we might have imposed on where munitions that we are supplying to Ukraine can be used, we have not said you can't use it on territory that Russia claims is Russia, but that we believe is Ukraine. Just don't strike Russia proper. Mm. So how do you think this will end? Well, you know, not long after this began, um, that question came up. And, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back, mainly because it's been such a terrible terrible war, but I thought we're looking at what is likely to be a very, very long stalemate. Mm -hmm. And that was based in part upon the situation that had been in place already for eight years. Yeah. I mean, Russia and Ukraine have been fighting in the Donbass since 2014, since Russia's original invasion of Ukraine, which was done, you know, originally with Uniform with troops not wearing Russian uniforms, they they engaged in one of these so-called hybrid operations. It was they they tried to create some deniability for a period of time about whether these were actually Russian troops who invaded Crimea and, mm -hmm. and, and the Donbas region. But we now know, of course, that these were regular Russian troops who would invade in eastern Ukraine. And for eight years, we had seen between 2014 and 2022. Um, uh, a, a really bloody stalemate. And what we see now is a, a bloody stalemate at a much, much more intensified level of bloodshed. I don't, I do believe that support for Ukraine will, will remain, um, will remain firm. I think that uh, the Europeans will have made it through or about to have made it through um, this winter which is really critical with respect to energy supplies. I think that would be the one real point of leverage um, that the Russians might have had to push the Europeans to maybe um, pressure the Ukrainians to explore a negotiated settlement. I think we'll have another six months between now or eight months between now and the next winter. And I think we'll see the Europeans making significant progress in terms of expanding alternative sources of energy, which means their dependence on Russian natural gas will decline. It takes mm -hmm. time to bring that online, but it, it will be brought online. Um, and so I don't see any diplomatic or political pressure likely to be imposed on, uh, on Ukraine to pursue a, a negotiated settlement. We'll have to watch what happens in the American Congress, right, now that we have a, 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 um, a Republican uh, party in charge of the, uh, of the Congress. But I don't think there's great um, feeling for Russia among the Republican majority. I mean, there are some who are, uh, ha have less of an interventionist or more of an isolationist stance and maybe are unhappy with simply the amount of money that's being spent on this. So again, we have to watch to see how this will play out. But I think it's likely as well that domestic political support 
uh, in the United States for Ukraine's efforts, which will bring with it the ability to continue resupplying um, Ukraine um, militarily will continue. I think Russia's we see going to make a, a huge push to see if they can expand their control of territory in the Donbass with, again, just overwhelming numbers of manpower. Hmm. Um, there may be a limit to how long that tactic is sustainable. I think the next couple of weeks could be really critical for uh, Ukrainian forces if they can hold the ground. I think uh, Russian forces may find themselves so depleted, both in terms of manpower and also munitions. Mm. But we read stories about how these two sides are running out, are, are, are just expending ammunition, yeah. artillery shells, missiles at a staggering rate. And, and I do believe that the West collectively has more ability to replenish Ukraine's supplies than Russia has to replenish its supplies. So, you know, we could be, the likeliest scenario is that the stalemate really continues for a long time with small changes in control of ground on the battlefield. The other scenario though, is that if manpower and munitions on the Russian side become exhausted, uh, we could see the possibility of a of a collapse of Russian forces on the front lines. And we could see uh, you know, a pretty dramatic Ukrainian advance of the kind that we saw a few months ago when they retook significant um, portions of territory. So those seem to me to be the two uh, likeliest scenarios. And you know, above all, we hope that um, Russia does not perceive, or I hope that Russia does not at any point perceive that its back is um, sufficiently pressed against the wall that it feels the need to do something extremely mm. dangerous, like the use of uh, nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons. There's no real um, strategic, or there's no real battlefield reason to use such weapons. It would be something that the Russians might do to signify um, their political determination and political resolve. But, but again, I think we would then be entering into a very, very dangerous and risky situation. And I think the Russians themselves um, probably uh, also uh, recognize the risks and uh, maybe would be disinclined to pursue uh, that option. Let's hope. Let's hope. Anything else you'd like to add, Alan? I think that really has been, a, you know, has been a, a nice tour de horizon uh, of the situation. Um, mm -hmm. I, the one thing I would add is that um, you you asked, I think, rightly about. Um, what does Russia's invasion of Ukraine say about the role of the United Nations? As an international law professor, I guess I do have to say, um, even though the law was violated in this case, I do believe that law has been important. Mm. Um, I think the sense that what Russia has done is not only antithetical to our interests, but is a shocking violation of legal norms that we care about mm. for their own sake, not because of our immediate self-interest. Countries in Latin America voted to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm. They don't fear that Russia is going to invade them, right? This mm. was not uh, simply a geopolitical um, uh, a calculation of interests. I think international law and in the sense that Russia is endangering it has been really, really powerful in terms of helping to unify political support and institutional responses uh, to, uh, to Ukraine's invasion. So sometimes even when the law is broken, it um, can assert its power uh, in, in a decentralized system uh, like the international system. And I believe that international law actually has been uh, a powerful motivating, um, uh, a powerful source of motivation for the behavior uh, of states and has contributed to the really, really quite um, emphatic response uh, and condemnation uh, of Russia's invasion and, and, the, and the very intense support for Ukraine that we observe. That's a good place to end. Thank you very, very much, Alan. And my cat thanks you too. I think okay, well, always happy to you. Know, cats on Zoom. If I were at home, my <laughs> if I were at home, my cat would be there too. Instead, all you get is my bike. Um, so <laughs> cats on Zoom. Thank you so much.